Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. I'm going to stand out here with you for a little while and I'm going to try to settle a conflict that's been raging for 2,000 years. Now, I know I'm not qualified to do that, but I will attempt to settle all of those questions so that you'll have all the answers, thereby doing what the theological community apparently hasn't ever been able to do. And I hope that you laughed at that. It seems as though people come up with physical illustrations of what they believe to be theological truth. I suppose that I, I've heard it several hundred times in my life. There are two ways to get to heaven. One is to be born and never commit a sin, never all your life ever have an evil thought, never commit a sin, and then just walk up to the gates of heaven, tell God to move over and sit down because now there are two of us. And I hope you laughed at that. When I think about that, the first thought that comes to my mind is, you know, will that work? You know, am I omniscient? No. Am I eternal? No. Am I omnipotent? No. Am I omnipresent? No. So how could I say to God, move over? There are two of us. But there is a more basic consideration in all of the attributes of God that I've mentioned. One that I left out. Would I be righteous? Would I be righteous? I'm more than willing to admit that I would be innocent, but would I be righteous? And the problem is, again, it's a man-made illustration. And I don't believe it carries any biblical truth. And then I hear cases where, you know, you know maybe you've heard it, you walk down a hall and there's a door. You have absolute free choice, absolute free will. You can open that door and enter, or you can pass by and not enter. Absolutely up to you. It's totally your free choice. And if you enter, it's heaven. And on the other side of the door, there's a sign that says, Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. By golly, I'm glad I opened that door. And there we have the great conflict between your total free will to open the door. And on the other side, it says, Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And now we have this great paradox between man's free will and God's sovereignty. People are even preaching about the sovereignty of man. You know, that's what you say basically when you say that he has free will. He's sovereign when he has total free choice. Some renowned evangelist says, well, one thing you got to realize in the scriptures is God never overrules man's will. And you kind of scratch your head and you say, boy, that's an interesting thought. But is it biblical? Can any, anybody establish a biblical basis for such a conclusion? And then we hear comments like, well, you know, you got to understand, you know, that if I paid your debt and you didn't accept that payment, the debt isn't paid. And you sit and you think about that for a moment. And you think, well, if it's paid, don't make no difference whether I accept it or not. I mean, I owe I owe a million dollars. You pay it. Whoever I owed it to has no legal right to collect it again from me. Fact is, it was paid. 
and, and my acceptance of it doesn't determine whether or not it was paid. And folks, what I'd like to do is avoid all of these illustrations. I have had over the years, I've had any number of ministers say to me, well, okay, Steve, if you were locked in a jail cell and I paid your fine and they came down and unlocked the door, you're not free unless you walk out. And I'd think about that. Why am I not free if I choose to sit there for some silly reason? I'm still a free man. And then they'll use illustrations like, all right, I give you a brand new car and here's the key. But until you go down and you put it in the ignition, you don't have the car. I, that's crazy. I got the car. I can sit there and I can look at that car until it rusts away. It's my car. I don't have to drive it to make it my car. And folks, I could go on and on and on with these illustrations. I've heard them all. All of them leading to some kind of a paradox. The typical solution to this so-called paradox. And I'm going to suggest before we're through here, I think this is going to be a three-part series that you can make any paradox you want based upon your presuppositions. If you presume that man has a free will, you now have a paradox between man's free will and God's sovereignty. And I freely admit that the problem is I have deep disagreement with your presuppositions and that's what I want to that's what I want to look at. Scripturally, I really don't, I, I don't know where to begin, but I'd like to build a body of Scripture to establish what I believe to be a basic biblical principle. Man highly exalts his free will. And I, I've done this before with you. This, this isn't basically a uh, study on free will. I've, I've done a few of those videos and you can find them in one of the playlists. I've also done videos on God's sovereignty. I do find it amazing that few people seem to understand that the definition of will is desire. If you go to a dictionary, one of the synonyms that they will give you for will is desire. And somebody says, well, I can desire anything I want. But you see, want and desire are the same thing. What you're saying to me is I can desire anything I desire. And folks, that's circular reasoning. I, I agree with that. I, if you desire it, you can sure desire it. But what if you don't desire it? What if you don't desire it? That's where I want to begin in Scripture. I'd suggest to you, and, and you, don't, you don't have to turn to a lot of these verses because I'm going to run out of time. However, if you don't study them on your own, you're going to miss the grandeur of this final solution. Because it seems to me the typical solution today is to try to get you back into some scientific understanding that God is not limited by time. You know, the illustration is used that, that God is outside of time, and that comes down to a simple solution to this whole so-called paradox that, that God knew ahead of time. You know, because he's, he's outside of time, and He sees the whole picture he knew what you would choose. And so the typical evangelical conservative solution appears to be today God's foreknowledge 
you know, by definition, foreknowledge being his knowing ahead of time what you're going to do when you're presented with that choice. And I suggest to you that I do not believe that that is scriptural. First of all, I am firmly committed to the truth that we who are limited in time and live in time, that we have a basic principle that foreknowledge must, must incorporate foreordination. God couldn't possibly know that something was going to happen unless God foreordained it to happen. But that's kind of outside the realm of this study here this evening. In Psalm chapter 10, verse 3, the Holy Spirit says that the wicked boasts of his free will. Now that would bother me a lot if I preached free will. I don't know how many names that God calls us. I do know that He never calls us wicked. He never calls us sinner. He never calls us wicked. He, he never calls us unrighteous. But the wicked boasts of His free will, and I hear it every day. And I would not want to have myself included with the group of those who boast about their free will. But dearly beloved, the problem gets worse than that. You know, and again, I'm not going to ask you to turn to all, all of these scriptures. You all know that in Jeremiah, it says the heart is deceitful above all things and incurably wicked. Who can know it? You all know that in Romans 8, when we studied through that epistle, chapter 8, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit mind the things of the Spirit. The spiritual man does not mind anything that's fleshly, and the fleshly man does not mind anything that's spiritual. And if you think that I'm reading into the verse, well, you study it, okay? Because to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is at enmity with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, and it cannot be. So then they that are in the flesh absolutely cannot please God. Okay, so I have a mind that's at enmity with God and I absolutely cannot, in that condition, please God. And I have a heart that is deceitful above all things and incurably wicked. In John chapter 10, you all know the chapter, he that is a hireling flees because he's a hireling. Why does he flee? Now you be careful with that verse because before we're through here, I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna have you in a box canyon. Do you agree, do you agree with Christ that the hireling flees because he's a hireling? He didn't become a hireling because he fled. You don't become a, a thief because you steal. You know, he was already a hireling and that's why he fled. He fled because he was, he was what he was. Now, please think about that. I mean, we're not through yet. In Jeremiah chapter 13, can the leopard change his spots? Well, no. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? No. He is what he is. In Proverbs 23, verse 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Is that heart desperately wicked and incurable? Or is that a new heart? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. They that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, nothing more. 
they that are after the mind, the spirit mind the things of the spirit nothing more Romans chapter 3 there's none righteous no not one not one the man who was born who never committed a sin never had an evil thought finally winds up at the gates of heaven is he righteous no he's not well, in Romans 7, 18, I see that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells nothing good. Not one single thing good. Nothing good. Now, you tell me how the flesh, the carnal man, the old man, whatever you want to call it, could ever desire anything good if there's nothing good in it. But it gets worse. Matthew chapter 7. And here you have the Lord speaking. Now, I don't want to read, I don't want to read into the words of my Savior something that isn't there. You know, you look at them. Uh, you study them in the Greek or, or any of the translations, you look at them. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which comes to which come to you in sheep's clothing. They look like they're Christian. They look like you, they're your brother or sister in Christ. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree, listen, Every good tree brings forth good fruit, nothing more. But a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit, nothing more. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Oh, dearly beloved, your heart ought to be leap with joy here. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. But all my life, it's been preached to me that it can. You know, I was I was raised in a church where we had we had special prayer meetings every week for somebody. You know, poor guy. You know, he's the one guy in the church kept getting lost. You know, and boy, we gotta we gotta pray for brother so and so or whatever. You know. Well, what happened? Well, he somebody saw him going into a movie theater, or they they saw him coming out of a beer joint, or or whatever they saw him doing. And, and we had, we had pray, prayer meetings for the poor brother, you know, uh, not even sure he's really a brother. Dearly beloved, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. But we haven't finished the verse. In the same way, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So how can it have a free desire to desire, will, anything, good or evil, if it can't do anything but what its nature allows, but, but bring forth evil? The most that you could do with a free will, folks, is to say, sure, it's free to desire anything evil. That's, that's the most that you could do scripturally. That's the fact of the matter, folks. Or, or, or these verses don't mean what they say. They don't make a lick of sense. Free will, dearly beloved, does not factor into the equation simply because you and I are dual-natured individuals. Two natures, okay? The old man can do nothing good. The new man can do nothing but righteousness. And the you in that equation is distinctly separate from those two. There's a third man here, okay? You're not your old man. You're not your new man. You are a person, third person, in possession of both an old and a new man. The question is, the question is, and this is what ought to concern you, is how do we function more out of the new man than the old man? Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 43 and 44. For a good tree bringeth not forth 
corrupt fruit, neither doth it, does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit, for every tree is known by his own fruit. Okay? Listen. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, nothing more. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, remember that's the desperately, incurably wicked heart, bringeth forth that which is evil, nothing more. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. What I've tried to do here is lay a scriptural basis for the fact that one, one can only desire what comes from his, his root condition. He's either a natural man or he's a spiritual man. Now, of course, a, a myriad of, of verses suddenly come up about not believing, uh, about condemnation, and, and so forth. And I want you to realize that the Holy Spirit says in 1 Corinthians, we, we read this, though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is renewed, being renewed day by day. Now, folks, I didn't make up those two theological men. Okay, I didn't make them up. I, I read of two natures, a carnal nature and a spiritual nature. Now, I don't exactly see that word in the Scriptures, but I do see an old man and a new man. I do see an outward man and an inward man. And I see that the outward man is perishing. He doesn't do anything good. God is not trying to clean up that old man. He's not going to heaven. We know that that no murderer, no adulterer, no fornicator, or such like shall enter heaven. And such were some of you, it says, but you were washed. You became a new creation in Christ. You have an inward man. And all of a sudden, we are faced with 1 John. That the person in whom Christ abides cannot sin, for his seed, Christ's seed, abides in him and he cannot sin. If he can sin, then everything said in Matthew 7 and, and Luke chapter 6 is wrong. If the new creation who was made righteous, Romans 4, raised again because we are made righteous, if the one made righteous can still sin, he's not righteous. Because the Word of God says that righteousness cannot bring forth unrighteousness. Neither can unrighteousness bring forth righteousness. In 1 John, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Now, doesn't that bring us back to the hireling fleeing because he is a hireling? What's the solution? The solution that's posited today, based upon some assumption that God can see the end from the beginning, therefore He knows what your free will is going to do. I, what is your free will, folks, going to do when you're totally evil, carnal, fleshly, until you're a new creation? Where have you got anything that's going to desire good? All you've got is something that brings forth nothing but evil. The works of the flesh are these. We read they're manifest in Galatians chapter 5. And you've got the whole list of them there. None of them good. The solution is not that God saw that you were going to do something, but, but that you are His. And somehow the choosing, though it says chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, I mean, that ought to be, that ought to be a slight hint. It ought to be a, a slight hint that it occurred before you were born, before you were ever conceived of, thought of. 
Therefore, it was not based upon anything you did or what you are. What, what right does God have to choose me over somebody else who's just as, as nice and handsome and, and good and whatever? Folks, that's not the way it happened. Not only was I chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, but it was by birth. Birth. That is the solution. Not looking at something where God who isn't limited by time could see what your evil nature was going to do. Now, what's the purpose of the law? What was the purpose of the law? What was God teaching Israel? When God set Israel aside, it wasn't to say that, you know, you should have kept the law. It was to show that man can't, cannot keep the law. And God has to do it. And Christ is the fulfillment of the law. That's why the Scriptures are, they which testify of me. If it isn't through Christ, man can't do it. And somehow or other, the Christian community seems to feel that we can do today what Israel didn't do in our own strength, in, in their own strength. And, and we can't. We cannot. You know, when the rabbi, when Nicodemus came to Christ, John chapter 3, you must be born again. That's the must of necessity, not the must of obligation. And somehow or other in modern evangelism, you know, and, and it's in the last hundred years, we have somehow twisted our own language and our own understanding of words to conclude that there is synergism between the baby and the mother, between the child and his parents. You know, boy, am I glad I told you, you, you mom, mom and dad, you know, I'm glad I told you guys to get together and have me. Right, folks, the language itself would not support such a thing. Why did God choose birth to illustrate our, our relationship with Him? Why? Because clearly the decision is up to the parents. And Nicodemus, as a rabbi, sh should know that you must be born again. So Christ either said to Nicodemus, you must be born from above, where Nicodemus had no synergism in that birth, or you must be born a second time, just like you were the first time. And, and in the first birth, he had no synergism. He had no choice. Only his parents. So whether you take it as from above, from the power of God, or a second time, apparently Nicodemus, well, you know, he took it, he took it as a second time. And Christ was talking about spiritual truth. But where does one get a desire? A will. Don't use the word will separate from desire. You desire what you desire. You do not desire what you do not desire. Christ clearly says that the desires of the old man are all evil. All evil. And to suggest in any way that they can be good is to go beyond what's written. The desires of the new man are only good and to go beyond what is written is wrong. New creations in Christ cannot sin if they can sin, they are not righteous. And it's as simple as that. Born from above, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus with a mind that is not at enmity with God. That is, it's subject to the law of God. That It does nothing but bring forth good fruit. The best that the old man can do is sin. The flesh brings forth death. God's Word tells me I am given a new heart, I am given a new mind, and I am given new desires 
And those were given to me by God. He's the one who made me what I am. He's the one who made me a new creation in Christ Jesus. I didn't do that. And it is an abortion of Scripture to suggest that man initiated the process. Believer is a, is a title, a term of endearment. It's a title that God uses of His own. And I am absolutely persuaded heaven's going to be populated with people who never, ever once made any public confession of belief. If the character of the new creation is believer, then he's a believer. It doesn't matter whether he ever believes or not. You know, it might make a tremendous difference in the way that he lives, in his peace, his rest, his deliverance from wrath. All of that might make a huge difference in his peace and his joy and in his happiness. But it doesn't change the fact that he's a believer. We are believers because, not because we believe, because we're born of the Spirit and the title God uses is a grand and glorious title and I believe it applies to the baby that died in childbirth as well as the soldier in North Korea who never ever heard the gospel. But he's a new creation in Christ Jesus. Never knew it. So that God will declare some from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Meanwhile, modern evangelism remains convinced that man is sovereign, not God. Concerning new birth, if you believe in free will, if you believe in free will, you believe that man is sovereign, not God. Dearly, dearly beloved, we're always looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12.2 Yet almost every church that I have stepped into since I was five years old wants me, wanted me to believe, wants me to believe that I, I was the author and I'm the finisher. And you may not find much disagreement to Christ being the finisher, but you say He's the author, and folks, you've trespassed on sacred ground. The sovereignty of God and redemption was tossed aside for non-existent, it was traded for non-existent free will long before you and I ever arrived on the scene. You were born into a multi-generational lie while the truth remains woven throughout the tapestry of Scripture. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful that we are who we are, new creations in Christ that you love us, that you guide us, that you teach us. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.